want to welcome you to another uh, Friday evening Vesper. Again, your host, Pastor Darren Tinsley. We're so glad that you're able to join us tonight as the Sabbath hours are descending upon us. Um, and depending on where you are, the Sabbath ha may have already begun uh, for you. And so to those who have already entered into the Sabbath, we would say happy Sabbath. And to those who, um, as myself, on the Sabbath uh, is descending upon us, even as we speak, I say to you, happy Sabbath as well. Again, we have come tonight, uh, as is our custom, to study the Word of God. And so again, we are so grateful that you are able to uh, fellowship here with us. Again, we're um, uh, every Wednesday night at 7.30. Uh, uh, let me just say that, 7.30, so the times can be consistent um, with Friday evening. So 7.30 on Friday evenings. 7.30, 7.30 on Wednesday evenings, 7.30 on Friday evenings, and then we have our service. Um, we have uh, Children's Corner at 8 a.m. Sabbath morning, and then we have our 11, uh, 15 midday service. Just an announcement, uh, due to um, some um, uh, things that have happened uh, that is out of our control, we will not be uh, live streaming uh, tomorrow at midday service. We'll still have our children's corner at 8 a.m., but we will not be live streaming um, our midday service due to some um, uh, technical issues that are that's out of our control. Uh, so um, we we still debating, but we may uh, uh, come back and do something in the evening, maybe at five o'clock. Um, if we do, we will definitely notify you um, as, as to that uh, venture. As a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and now and say it. Tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock, we will uh, go live. So no one has to be up in the air um, as to what we're going to do. So we are not going to, we're going to do our children's corner at 8 a.m. And then we are going to live stream again at 5 p.m., um, due to some technical things that we're, that's out of our control, we're not going to be able to live stream uh, in the midday. Um, but I'll return and we'll uh, live stream from here at 5 p.m. on tomorrow. So again, tomorrow morning, Children's Corner, 8 o'clock, live stream. And then, I'll, then we will live stream again at 5 p.m. in the evening. Um, uh, due to, uh, because we won't be able to uh, live stream in the midday. So once again, we just, um, sorry for any convenience. Uh, you could always, uh, listen to gospel of health, prophesy again, um, in the interim. So again, we're just grateful for this opportunity that we can come tonight and be able to study the word of God. We've been going through here, um, looking at, those closing scenes. Now, it's been, it's been um, quite some time uh, that we have talked about and looked at those uh, particular scenes. And so some of the things may have been, uh, may have been lost to you. Maybe you're, you're just watching us uh, for the first time tonight. So once again, we'll have a prayer and we will uh, seek by God's grace to bring us to where we are today and then by God's grace, we want to be able to look into those things um, as it relates to this image of the beast and the Sanhedrin um, that we're talked about. Um, so with that, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for um, uh, the trials and all the things that you have allowed in your love to come upon us. We're grateful, Lord, that we can give you our hearts. We're grateful that we made the decision um, that there's nothing more precious to us in this life than to know you. This is life eternal. So we pray that you would strengthen us, Father. Help us to know that you have not brought us thus um, to leave us, and may we not come to this point in our experience and lean to our own understanding. 
trust in our own devising and our own abilities. Help us, Father, to uh, know you more and realize that it is even more now that we need you than before. So be with us this night. Be with those who are watching um, and listening. Keep us, we pray. We ask for a special portion of thy spirit in harmony with the times in which we live in and what the soul needs. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Um, I pray that uh, all is well with you. Um, you know, as we were just just as we were praying, uh, something came to my mind. Um, uh, you know, having a garden, um, it really helps you to see um, the need and the care that God is putting in as you contrast um, your experience a lot of times with the things that grow from the ground. You know, and, and having a garden, it, it is, is a school in and of itself. And I would encourage um, implore anyone who does not have one, even if you have to grow things in a bucket, there are lessons to be learned from the ground. There are things that God would show us that we would um, gain a better understanding of the scriptures if we would take the opportunity to begin to plant and to um, plant just a little garden doesn't have to be big. You don't have to go and mutilate your whole backyard. But if you could just take, you know, um, uh, four by four, you know, um, four by four and just put something uh, and dig up a little spot and began to just plant something, the lessons you will learn from that. And while we were praying, I was thinking about as we as I mention our need for the Holy Spirit, I thought about that drip system um, and how essential that drip system is. I've learned that, you know, we, we, are, we God gives us the rain and that rain uh, we cannot uh, dispense with. Um, yet that continuous dripping of that water, um, that, 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 that plant needs that continuous dripping, what a benefit it is to the life and growth of the plant. And brothers and sisters, you and I need to have our own drip system where there's a constant um, uh, uh, watering of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And so we must have that seed because a drip system without the seed would not be beneficial. And so we need that word to be implanted in the life <clears throat> as we're teaching our children um, uh, to commit scriptures to memory um, as we have been admonished uh, um, to have a book with us, um, um, you know, in, in times where we can just read, we can stop, we can pray, we can meditate. It's like that continuous drip system that the, the soul is constantly being fed and watered by the Spirit of God. And we're actually growing in grace moment by moment, the song says, we can be kept in his love moment by moment. We can have life from above. This is what God longs to do for us. There's a quotation here. I just want to read it as we go into our study tonight. Um, last week, we, we, we just sort of put a uh, parenthetical study uh, talking about the latter rain. It's not necessarily our focus tonight, but I want to just read this one quotation where it says, only those, notice this, only those, underscore that word only, only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. And when we're talking about light, we're talking about understanding. We're talking about knowing more about Christ. 
knowing more of who he is. His glory is being revealed more and more. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Notice, unless, unless, underscore that word unless, unless we are, underscore, daily, underscore, advancing in the exemplification, exemplifying, uh, on display, manifesting, showing it, unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues. Watch this. We shall not underscore, shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. Notice, only those who are living up to all, living up to the light, they have received, will receive greater light unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestation, we are told, of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. And it may, this part here, it may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not what? Discern or what? Receive it. Why? Because we're not living up to the knowledge that God has given to us. As it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, we are not adding to our faith. We're not adding. And we're expecting God to multiply, but we're not adding. These active Christian virtues to our characters. And so, brothers and sisters, we need to be daily advancing. That is to be our focus in life. Ask yourself the question, are you daily advancing in the active Christian virtues? This implies actions. So God wants to give us his Holy Spirit. God wants to move beyond just the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. He wants to move just just beyond convicting us, convincing us that these decisions that have been made are wrong. God wants to um, also reveal unto us righteousness. He wants to, he wants to show us the power of God in our lives and not only our lives, but he wants to use us to be a, a signboard, if you will, he wants us to be a specimen, a, uh, uh, um, um, a representation of what can happen in the heart of humanity when we are surrendered to Christ. This is what the world needs, brothers and sisters. This is what the world needs. This is what it needs. It has seen what sin does it has seen what compromise creates. It sees what um, theocracy, it sees what religion detached from the power of Christ can do, but it has not seen, it has heard through sermons, but it has not seen active, these active Christian virtues. It has heard about Jesus. And it is convinced that Jesus was a good man. The world is convinced that, that, that Jesus really loved people. The world is convinced that Christ was all powerful. But there is some skepticism because those who profess to be his representatives are not exemplifying his patience, his love, his meekness, his his long suffering, his gentleness. This is what they don't see. Temperance.
this is what they don't see in the representatives of Christ. They hear about it, but they do not see it, brothers and sisters. Now, we've been talking about these closing scenes concerning Christ's life, and we are uh, um, we, 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 uh, was dealing with, you know, we, we started our presentation some weeks, months back, talking about Christ in the upper room with the disciples as they carried out the communion feast. Then we found that as Jesus left the communion feast, he entered into the garden. And we talked about how Jesus began to trod that wine press alone. Jesus, as it were, was walking the wine press. We saw the parallel with um, Revelation 14, the wicked are going to be thrown into the wine press. The wine press is the path of, or the experience of the seven last plagues. When Jesus entered into the garden, Jesus was suffering, tasting death for every man. Jesus was being made sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus was placing himself between that broken law and man. Jesus experienced to the fullest the wrath of God. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation 14, verse 9 to 12, that there's going to be a cup that is poured out without mixture, that cup of indignation, that cup that the wicked, David tells us in Psalm 75, that the wicked are going to drink to its dregs. But we read how that cup of trembling, Jesus took it out of the hands of his people and Jesus, as he entered into the garden, as he's now before Annas and Caiaphas, Jesus is drinking that cup to its dregs for us. Jesus, we are told, Hebrews 13, that he would suffer, that Jesus suffered without the gate. When you look in Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 20. Two, you find the righteous in the city and the wicked on the outside of the city, outside of the gate. The Bible tells us, Revelation 22, 14, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may enter into the gates and that they may have right to the tree of life. But without, it says, are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, and it begins to list these individuals who are outside of the city. But wait a minute, Jesus, we are told in Hebrews 13, suffered without the gate. Wait a minute, Jesus died outside of the city so that everyone would have access to the city. Those who suffer and die without the gate are those who reject the love of God. Those who reject the death that Jesus died. Paul says, Hebrews 2, that Jesus taste death for every man, brothers and sisters. Jesus tasted death. And so as Jesus passed through the garden, as the cup trembled in his hand, we read how Jesus made the decision after that third father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. But he knew if the cup should pass, then, then you and I would have to drink it. You and I would have to drink that cup to his dregs. So Jesus, while he passed around the cup, which was a symbol of his blood, his life to the disciples, while he passed around a symbol of his broken body in the bread to the disciples, Jesus says, there is a cup that I must drink. And that cup is not served at this table. I give you life 
through my death. So Jesus drunk that cup while the disciples were drinking that cup of life. They did not understand that the only way that they could drink that cup was because Jesus was about to drink their cup. So in actuality, they were drinking the cup that was Jesus. He was drinking the cup that was theirs. That cup of woe and misery and death, Jesus drunk it. But wait a minute, don't people still die? Yes, brothers and sisters, but because of Jesus' death, he has likened our death to a sleep. Jesus died the second death, but Jesus says, sleep on now and take your rest. Jesus says that the death that it says, what does he say in Psalms? I believe it's Psalms 115, where he says, it says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It is a sleep, it's rest. But what Jesus suffered was not a rest. Jesus suffered misery. Jesus suffered pain for us. And so as Jesus goes through that garden, and while Jesus makes the decision, while Jesus is making the decision to die in our stead, man is making a decision to destroy the Son of God. Man is making a decision to reject the love of God. Now, brothers and sisters, as we said before, when we consider these scenes of Christ's life, we must not become so haughty and so hmm, naive and say, wow, if I had been there, I never would have done that. But oh, as we examine our lives, as we measure our lives, not by the failures and faults of others, this is why, brothers and sisters, we must be careful. We must be careful when faults are presented to us because by beholding, we can become changed. By watching and repeating the faults of others, we are told that we will soon become just like them. We have the tendency to measure our success by the failures of others. And we see their fall. And we believe that by default, we have risen higher in the sphere and in God's ideal for man. And so we think that because of their failure, we have succeeded when that is not the case. So as we've been looking at these scenes, yes, we see Judas, but we have to look at ourselves. We have to say, wow, is this me? I understand what Judas did and, 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 and Judas works will follow. Judas will have to give an account for the deeds done in his body. But wait a minute. I am told in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 that I can put through willfully sinning, I can put Jesus to an open shame. I can, as it were, be guilty or even worse than what Judas did. Judas was deceived. But oh, brothers and sisters, we profess to walk in the light and yet we can be just as guilty as Judas with our uh, uh, deceptive practices and our rejection of truth when it comes home to the conscience. And so we said that as we read these promises, as we read these things, we must keep in mind that it's warnings and it's promises are mine. Not just the promises, but also the warnings. We read in Desire of Ages under the chapter, A Doomed People, that Jesus is weeping for us, weeping and crying tears that we cannot cry for ourselves. Why? Because we have become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We become hardened by rejecting truth as we sit week after week 
and allow error to make us feel comfortable in a lost condition. We're constantly being told prosperity, prosperity, blessings. God wants to bless you. Ignore those who are talking about you. Ignore those who are ridiculing you. And brothers and sisters, we must not always sit and allow people or take others' ideas concerning us, but oh, we must not despise the chastening and the correction because we say, well, yes, I don't despise the chastening of the Lord, but what happens when God sends it through his messengers? What happens when God sends it through a friend, when God sends it through even a foe? Do we take that uh, uh, um, rebuke and that correction, do we take it or do we despise it? Do we push it to the side? Do we act as if someone, uh, uh, no, 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 no. You shouldn't be talking about these things. These things are not for, these, these things don't concern you. But no, brothers and sisters, and, and we become hardened. We become hardened. And guess what? Like we read in the quotation, the spirit of God will be falling on hearts all around us and we will not discern it or receive it because we're not keeping a pace with the light. So as we see these things concerning Judas, uh, concerning Annas and Caiaphas, let us not become so haughty as to say, wow, how could they and not see that it applies to us in this hour day, brothers and sisters. I want us, as we, so trying to catch you up. So now as we come and we recognize that Jesus was taken out of the garden, a mob came to get him. Judas had covenanted with the priest and he had given them a sign. And this sign was that whomsoever I kiss, hold him fast. Now we're going to highlight Judas in another study. We're going to take Judas as a character all by himself, as it is outlined in the book Desire of Ages, because Judas has the characteristics of many of us who profess the truth in these last days. We are told that Judas loved Jesus. We are told that Judas thought that if he would just associate himself with Christ, his life could be changed. When you begin to look at the opening chapters of Judas experience, it sounds like each and every one of us, brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, his earlier chapters may be more admirable and more sincere than most of our convictions for following Jesus today. And so we see that Jesus is accosted by a mob. This mob actually wanted to take Jesus. They tried to take Jesus before. Go in your Bibles to the book of John. Go in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 7. Let's go in our Bibles uh, to the book of John, chapter 7. John, chapter 7. There was confusion in these closing scenes concerning Christ's life. The disciples, they didn't understand. They, 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 they thought that Jesus would bring about this deliverance. They thought that Jesus was going to have mercy, that he was going to make the church great again. They thought that Jesus was going to exalt their institutions. They thought that Jesus was going to exalt the sanitarium work. And they thought that Jesus was going to exalt the, the, the educational work. And they thought that Jesus was going to magnify the pulpit and the preaching and the evangelism. They thought that Jesus was going to make all these things honorable. And they thought that Jesus was going to cause the whole world to come and acknowledge that the Seventh-day Adventist church this is God's church and we need to be a part of it. And so people today are looking for God to make the church great again. They're looking for something, brothers and sisters, that is not indicated anywhere in the scriptures. But we have shaped and crafted a narrative that despite 
our current spiritual condition that there's nothing that God will not do without us. No matter what our spiritual condition is, we have so crafted a narrative and we have led people to believe that in spite of what we believe and do and profess, God will do nothing but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the conferences. This is what we believe, brothers and sisters, though it may not in some, but even in many sermons, it is, it is, it is brought forth that in spite of what we see, just hold on our best days as a denomination are ahead of us. Nothing can be further from the truth, brothers and sisters. That narrative fits nowhere from Genesis to Revelation, but it is something that we have imagined in our own minds to justify and silence the conviction of the Holy Spirit that we are not what we profess to be. Yes, we cry. Yes, we're Laodicea, but we are told that that message upon which the destiny of the church hangs has been half heeded, if not entirely disregarded. So um, before we can fulfill a commission, that message has to be received. And when that message is received, received, it will purify the receivers of the message. We are told that when the message is received, a standard will be raised and we will pour forth the straight truth. That's not happening. So that is an indication to us that the message has not been heeded and it has been disregarded because we don't want to believe that we are as bad as the messenger of God has told us. We don't want to believe we're that bad. We believe that God is going to send us someone else. Notice what it says in John chapter seven, John chapter seven. I want you to notice, brothers and sisters, this was during the Feast of Tabernacles. And they thought that, uh, uh, um, and they sent, here the priests sent soldiers. Here the priests had, had used the world, they were using the world to now go and silence the word. Now remember, John 1 verse 14, uh, John 1 verse 1 down to verse 3, then you go to verse 14, where it says the word was made flesh. That word is the gospel. First Peter 1 25. That word is the gospel by which that the gospel is preached unto us by the word. So we understand that when we're talking about Jesus and we are talking about uh, uh, the message, we are using Jesus in as, as a, um, in synonymous with the gospel, the word in the book, early writings, I believe the chapter is, is early writings over there. Uh, Philip Timothy should be a Brown book right there on there on your, uh, um, no, not there. Do you see a book? Oh, have mercy. It's in the house, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, if you happen to look over there, look over, look on that shelf somewhere, all those books, look for early writings. Now, Come back with me. When we see there's a, in early writings, it says that as the Jewish nation rejected Jesus, so I saw the nominal churches rejected the first and the second angel's message. So just as the Jews rejected Jesus, so the churches rejected the messages. So the message of Christ, so Christ synonymous with his message, we reject the message, we are rejecting Jesus. And so what happens is these priests send out these officers to silence the message, to silence Jesus. But what happened when they encounter the message, Jesus, notice what it says. John seven, you don't see it. Okay. John seven, it says in verse 
45. John 7, verse 45, it says this, Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? Verse 46. And the officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have, notice, have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? Have any of these religious leaders, have any of these men of degrees, these men, these scholars, these uh, doctrine of divinities, have any of these men, do any of these men preach this message? Do you hear any of us from our pulpits preaching this message? Do, have you ever come into our church and heard any of our preachers who have gone to our institutions? Do you hear any of these men preaching this? Are you also deceived? But notice what he says. But this people, speaking of the congregants, speaking of those who attend the churches, it says, but this people who knoweth not the law are what? Kurt, wait a minute. These people haven't gone to our school. These people don't understand uh, uh, apologetics. These people don't, 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 under, don't have a degree in, in, in uh, 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 they, they, they don't have a degree in Greek and Hebrew. They don't understand uh, uh, um, how to uh, uh, exegesis. They don't understand, they, they, they have not gone to our institutions. They don't have, they have not uh, uh, sat and got this higher, crit, have, have uh, uh, been, been, been taught this, this critical thinking when it comes to the Bible. How can, how can you be persuaded by these people who don't have degrees, they haven't gone to our schools. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't care what, what, what they do, but they're cursed. But brothers and sisters, the same thing. They thought the same thing about John the Baptist and the same thing about Jesus. He doesn't have, he doesn't have the qualifications to be a public speaker. If you want to be a preacher, then you must go through the proper channels. And this is what people are encouraged to do all the time. This is what people are encouraged to do all the time. They masquerade behind present truth. They masquerade behind these, uh, 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 these, these, these quotations and they, they masquerade behind it. But what do they tell people who they see? Hey, you know, man, if you really want to do it, I think you should go to our schools. Wait a minute. But our schools are teaching this and teaching. Hey, man, look, I came through the schools. I'm OK. I, I, I have a I have a degree uh, uh, from a seminary. Now, brother, I, I, I want you to understand the, the ideology. I want you to understand the, the thinking here. I have a degree from an institution that I believe to be Babylon. It's an institution that I believe to be Babylon that teaches false theories, false doctrines, and has an erroneous idea and concept as it relates to the scriptures, but I have a degree from their institution. Now, wait a minute. When you get a degree from an institution, you do not go in there and say, I want to read these books and give me a degree. No, 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 no. You must read their books. Not only must you read their books, but when you write up your thesis, it must be in harmony with their interpretation in order for you to get the degree. Therefore, if you have a degree from that institution, it is because you lent your mind to their thinking. Now, who is deceived here? I believe that those who have institutions 
who have went to those institutions to get degrees. Now you may say, well, these people are deceived. Well, that's an honest deception, but this is a willful deception because you deceive them in thinking that you believe like them when actuality you believe something else. So you're really confused. So now could it be, could someone really believe that they are a threat to your existence if you're coming to their schools and getting degrees? No, brothers and sisters. And this is what they thought. This is why they said to these, to these rulers, uh, to these officers, they said, are you deceived? Have you ever heard any one of us preaching this? These people are cursed. So they're looking at their con they're looking at people who believe in the message as a people who are cursed. Now I want you to notice brothers and sisters, they, they, they didn't believe this at all. Now I want us to look at two confusing things. I want you to go in your Bibles to <clears throat> jump back to Luke, jump back in your Bibles um, to Luke and let's look here. And I want you to notice the disciples down. The disciples are, are, are confused. So we're going to go to Luke 24. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Let's look at verse 13. Luke, the 24th chapter. <clears throat> and I want us to look at verse 13. All right. Again, they, they, the mob comes to get Jesus. Judas is leading the mob. Judas is, uh, uh, he, 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 he abandons his position and he joins the rank of the opposition. Judas represents, according to great controversy, a large class who profess faith in the third angel's message, but will abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Now, Baptist, Presbyterian, Catholic, <clears throat> um, um, and Methodist, uh, Pentecostal, and you can, and, and uh, Buddhists and, and Hebrew Israelites and Muslims and, and, and you could non-denominational, you can, you can run down the list. None of them profess faith in the third angel's message. There's only one class of people on the planet earth that profess faith in the third angel's message. And that is the seven Adventist church. And we are told that a large class who profess faith in the third angel will abandon their position. There's a large class in the seven Adventist church that is represented by Judas, represented by Judas. And brothers and sisters, when you, when we begin to study Judas character and when we study Judas in, in, in coming, pre in our coming presentations, you are going to see that Judas represents more of those who profess present truth than even those who are outright, uh, uh, who you would think have gone totally crazy. You would look at some preachers. And you will look at some and you will say, man, these men have completely lost their mind. No, no, no. That's not Judas, brothers and sisters. That's not Judas. Judas masqueraded under the guise of present truth. And so Judas represents, this, uh, represents many in the church who profess to believe present truth. Now, let me, let me say this. When you read, when you go through and I pray that you will someday. Um, when you go through the testimonies, you'll, when you look at the terminology, present truth, it was designated to talk about everyone who professed to be a part of the God's people, the last day movement. They were all classified as believing in present truth. But now what has happened, present truth is coined against a very small segment of the church. And we have to be very careful of even about that, that label, because it's a very generic term. It's very generic. You know, some say, well, this person preaches on the sanctuary. He preaches present truth because we could read in early writing 63 when it talks about 
the sanctuary, the 2300 days of the faith of Jesus, and we classify that sum and sum total as present true. Well, brothers and sisters, no, T.D. Jakes has a series on the sanctuary. So if just preaching on the sanctuary is present truth, then that means T.D. Jakes believes in present truth. T.D. Jakes has a whole series on the sanctuary. I, can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can't think of them now, but I've, I've seen them when I've gone into various Christian bookstores. I've seen pastors who have whole series on the sanctuary. So if believing in the sanctuary is by itself present truth, then that means all these people believe in present truth. So, but because we, we have not, many of us have not read consistently and in a sequential order through the testimonies, don't have any idea what present truth is. And if someone mentions the law, if someone mentions the second coming, if someone mentions, we say, wow, this brother's preaching pre present truth. And we don't, un we have no idea what that is. We have, we, so we, many of us don't know what that is. Judas represents that class, that class. So I'm not saying, oh, no, uh, I'm, Pastor Tinsley said we shouldn't call. No, Pastor Tinsley didn't say that. Pastor Tinsley saying you need to understand what it is so that as you apply it, you can understand context and sequence and how it is to be applied. Amen. When we look at the disciples here, the disciples were confused. Now we're talking about leading up to the garden, right? We're talking about the mob coming and getting Jesus. They're, 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 they're confused about what is to transpire. If you go back and you go from Matthew 21, Luke 19, when Jesus is riding, as it were, triumphantly, and the palm branches are being laid before him, Jesus is on the colt. He is being led, and he's now coming, as it were, to the temple, Luke 19 uh, uh, gives us a picture that Matthew doesn't. And Luke 19 shows us that Jesus stops on the brow before going into the temple and he literally weeps over the city. But we are told that when Jesus stops and as he notices the city, the crowd notices what he's looking at and they are looking at with satisfaction saying, almost looking, saying, wow, Look how beautiful the city is. Look, man, and, and all the promises of David and the Psalms are, re, are, are being brought to their remembrance and they're thinking of all these things and they're looking at Jerusalem in a way that would, that would inspire glory, but only to hear moans and groanings from Jesus weeping over the city, not seeing, seeing the city soon to be laid desolate, soon to see it lead as it were, even with the ground. And as Jesus gathers his composure, he goes into the Jerusalem, not to exalt himself king, but to cleanse the temple of traffic. The same temple that he cleansed in John chapter two. And all of a sudden we see a, 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 as it were, we see a uh, mercy. We see a, uh, 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 a refilling of the temple because we understand Desire of Ages, the chapter is in his temple. Um, Desire of Ages, the chapter is in his temple, but it shows that the traffic in the precincts of the Jerusalem was, was permitted by the priest. And they rejected Jesus because he overturned those tables. The people did. And then this second encounter, the temple is filled as it were with greater traffic. And Jesus comes in and he once again chases out the mob. And now the disciples, and now the Pharisees come and the Pharisees say, bid thy disciples, bid these people to hush. And the children start to speak. The children start to preach. Now, the disciples are confused by all of this. They don't understand what is happening. Jesus is preaching. Jesus is telling them various things, but the scriptures are being confused in their minds. They're not understanding. 
write down Matthew chapter 17. Remember when Jesus was descending from the Mount of Transfiguration and Jesus says, told him, tell no man the vision until the son of man be risen. There's like, wait a minute, be risen. Why do they say that John the Baptist or, or that Elijah must first come? They're, they're confused. The, 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 the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees have confused their minds. But it's not just the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees, brothers and sisters. Judas has, is confusing them as well. Oh, mercy, brothers and sisters. I'm just seeing this now for the first time. This is why Judas, this is why we got to deal with Judas' character all by himself. Because, because when we study Judas, you're going to find that many things that Jesus said to the disciples, Judas confused it. Judas would come and, 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 and spin it in a way that Christ never intended. She brings out in the book, Desire of Ages, that many, that, 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 that the contention among the disciples was usually started by Judas. We are told that Judas would suggest scriptures to counteract what Jesus said. And this is what we're finding, brothers and sisters, with many who profess to believe or say they're present truth preachers who have been labeled by the people as preaching present truth. They confuse what you're reading in the testimonies in the conflict series. You clearly read in, in the conf from Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, pr uh, Prophets and Kings, John of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, uh, uh, and great controversy, you clearly see God has laid out a plan, but all of a sudden someone comes and says, no, 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 no. And they, they begin to twist these things and begin to lure you into a carnal security. No, no, don't talk about what's happening in the churches. Be quiet. <clears throat> don't say anything about your wife. Be quiet. Shh. Hush mode. Don't talk about those things. Why? Because you have labeled me as present truth. And if you're constantly agitating these things, then they're going to think that I subscribe to this and they're going to shut me out of their churches. And so they do their best to, to craft arguments so that you will be silent so that they don't have to give an account for your zeal. This is what's happening, brothers and sisters. And so what's So the disciples are confused. They're confused as to what's happening. Now, let's look at Luke. Let's look at Luke 24. Luke 24, on the road uh, to Emmaus, and Jesus comes. Now, I want you, oh, mercy. Watch this. Luke 24, I want you to look at verse 13. The Bible, hmm, the Bible says in verse 13, and behold, two of them went that same day to the village called Emmaus. This is the day of the resurrection. The women have come back and, and watch it. You'll see it. Notice, um, same day called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Verse 16, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another? And ye, as ye walk and are sad, they're discussing all of the events and they're sad. They're dejected. They're dejected by it. And it goes on and it says, 18, and one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, watch, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Verse 20, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Verse 21, but we trusted that it had been he 
which should have redeemed Israel. Wait a minute. They said our leaders, our union, conference, whatever. And brothers and sisters, I'm not just highlighting union and conference presidents um, because some of those union conference presidents, I believe, are going to stand for truth. I believe that many of them are, have found themselves in positions where they are, where they are outnumbered and the pressure and their position and their finances are in jeopardy and therefore they remain silent. I am not there to, to, to say that these men are evil and they're wrong and God is going to just no, brothers and sisters, because many times we are silent when we should speak and we don't have our jobs on the line. Amen. Many times we should say something to someone in the line. Many times we should say something to the person next to us on our jobs, but we are silent and yet we condemn them for their silence. But God will do But again, God is moving upon the hearts of all of us. And so what happens is they said we, these men put him to death. And again, all of the priests were not in cahoots with Jesus being put to death. But it says, but we trust it. We trust it that he should have made the church great again. We were looking to him. We were looking for him to do something that again, brothers and sisters, that scripture did not outline. Scripture did not forecast this. So now I want you to notice this. And this is where I want to insert this. And we're, we're, we're examine this point in future studies. Have you ever heard the terminology that um, the church appears as though it is going to fall, but it doesn't? Have you ever heard that terminology before? The church appears as though it's going to fall, but it doesn't. Um, and I'm sure some of you are shaking your head saying, yeah, 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 I heard that. And many of us apply that to the stuff we see happening now. You know, we see people doing this and we see people doing that. And we're like, oh, man, oh, Lord, have mercy. Not, 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 not in the church. Oh, what? He did what? He said what? They're doing what? And then we're just, oh, man, and we're just, oh, Lord, have, oh, Lord, please. We, and we're, we're, Father, have mercy upon thy church. Look at what they're doing. Lord, have mercy. Not again. This happened this week. What? They said this yesterday. What? They voted this but they said, oh, man, and, I, and, and we're losing it. And then all of a sudden someone comes up and sort of, well, the church appears as though it's going to fall, but it doesn't. And everyone just kind of, oh, amen, and goes on that way. No, brothers and sisters, that's not talking about this, what we're seeing now. At the cross, where was the church? Caiaphas was there. Annas was there. The high priest and all his family members were there. Where was the church? Was that the church? Where was John? John was there. Peter was there. Mary was there. But what were they doing while everyone was wagging their heads? What were they doing while the thieves were cursing and reviling him? They were silent. Shh. It was nothing. It appears as though the church was gone. It appears as though it, it, it appears as though it had fallen. Where was the church? If you go back to Matthew chapter 16, Christ says, upon this rock will I build my church. Upon the testimony of those who acknowledge Jesus as a son of God, that's where his church, he was built. He, that's, that was his church. But at the cross, where was it? It wasn't there. Shh, silent. But after the dust clears, the Spirit of God begins to move upon the hearts of his people. And all of a sudden, they begin to rise out of the seemingly ashes. And then on the day of Pentecost, where did they come from? They came from a personal experience with Christ. So when it says the church appears as though it's going to fall, it is talking about that, that time, not this foolishness we're seeing 
at that time, because right now, everybody appears to be strong. You turn on the internet, and man, you go on Facebook, everybody appears to be strong. Oh, 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 and everybody just pounding their fists on those keys. How dare they say this? And they're pounding and pounding and posting and pounding. But oh, brothers and sisters, when it comes time to speak, silence, silence. Those who have not been living up to the light are not going to be prepared for this time. So here they trusted that it had been he. But I want us. Hmm, let's see, Lord. Let's see. We got to get through this. We got to we got to get through this. Let's see. Let's move forward and let's go in our Bibles. Let's go to Acts chapter four really quickly. Let's go to Acts chapter four, because remember, the, the, the priest already said, have any of the rulers believed on this? Do you hear us preaching this message? Uh, a man by the name of Desmond Ford stood up in California and he said that our religious leaders don't believe in this message. And he said, and he said, I could, he says, there's proof of it. He says, when did you hear at, and he named Andrews University because that is where the white, that's the, uh, uh, that's where the scholars are. That's where all of our, you know, any official scholarly, uh, all of our scholars are there at uh, uh, Andrews University. And he says, when was the last time you ever heard from that church this message? And he said, that is proof that our scholars, your scholars don't believe in this message that they profess to believe. That's on their books. They don't believe it. You will be hard pressed to find one, he said, because they're not preaching it. And this is what they said when those rulers came, when those officers came back. Have any of us preached this message? Have you heard any of us go through this message? No, you haven't heard it. Oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, 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 they, 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 I heard this, I heard this brother preach it. Well, praise the Lord for those who who are willing to do that. And, and again, it's not all, but they have a general rule that if anyone preaches this message, they will be put out of the synagogue, John chapter nine. But here you are in Acts chapter, Acts the fourth chapter. I want you to notice what they say to Peter and John when they bring them before them. And I want you to notice um, what it says in, is it four or is it five? Hmm. Let's see. Uh, I think it's chapter four. And uh, Maybe it's chapter five, chapter five. Um, oh, that's Annas. So I don't want that one, but it is chapter five, chapter five, uh, verse 28, chapter five, verse 28. Chapter five. Well, let's start in. 27, chapter 5, verse 27. Watch what it says. It says, And when and when they had brought them, John and Peter and other apostles, they set them before the council, and the high priest, this is Caiaphas, asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command that you should not teach in this man's name? And behold, he said, ye have filled Jerusalem with what? Your doctrines. We don't believe this. What you are now preaching, we do not subscribe to. This is what, this was the confused, this is what's leading up to Jesus coming into coming in before Annas 
and Caiaphas. <clears throat> they're bringing them before, they're bringing Jesus before the board. He's being brought in, not just to be chastised in a sense of being reprimanded by the church, but they are laying their charges for death, brothers and sisters. This is what, this is a prelude to the image of the beast, where church and state will come together for the purpose of, of silencing forever the people of God. This is what we're seeing. Now, I want us to, now the, the thing I want us to look at briefly as we look at these few slides here, and I'm over my time, but I, I, I want us to look at some slides and I want us to see, I want us to look at these quotations and I want us to see how we got to this point. How did the church get to the point where they would do this dastardly deed and deny the truth? and deny the truth. Um, have mercy. I wish I had that early writings, but I will dispense with that tonight and we'll come, we'll revisit that in the future. Because again, we have, we, we, I want to keep the parallel as we go through this. We're looking at Jesus in the person. In our day is not the person, but the message. It is the message of Christ that is going to bring us before the councils. Now, remember, we just read in Acts 5, 27 and 28, it was the message that brought the disciples to the council. The angel had freed them from prison and they did not accost them because of, because of what happened but they brought him in and said, you must not speak in the same. And then they went on to beat them. But what happens is we find here um, in, as, as, as Christ is being brought before Annas and Caiaphas, how did they get to this point where they could openly reject, watch this, the message? How could they come to the point that they are where they can open in the open air reject the message. Remember, a large class who profess faith in the third angel will abandon their position, join the rank of the opposition. How did they get to this point? How do we get to this point? Watch this. Notice this. Let's go back. This is speaking about when the, at the birth of Jesus, you had the shepherds in Luke chapter two, and you had the wise men in Matthew chapter two. Luke chapter two, you have the shepherds uh, watch who are watching their flock by night. And you have the wise men who are watching their flock by night. Now, I want you to notice this. The report of the angels visit to the shepherds, Luke chapter two, had been brought to Jerusalem. But the rabbis had treated it as unworthy of their notice. Now, I want you to write down, this is taken from Desire of Ages, page 62, okay? So I'm going back, Desire of Ages, page 62. Now, I want you to write next to that. I want you to put Great Controversy, page 313, page 314, because there's a similar parallel when God is, a, was about, is when God was bringing the message of the first and second angel to his people, is the same parallel when Jesus, when angels was bringing the message of Jesus' birth to his people. It would be preceded by John, the voice in the wilderness that would make way for the entrance of Christ. Same parallel, brothers and sisters. Great Controversy 313, 314. I don't have time to read that to you tonight, but it says the report of the angel's visit to the shepherds had been brought to Jerusalem 
had been brought to Jerusalem. But, but, but the rabbis had treated it as unworthy of their notice. Oh, Lord, just something just came to me. Something just came to me because remember, I asked you the question, how did they get to this point? And even as I asked you that, I was saying, Lord, how, how, how I see this, but how? And it just came as we made those parallels. Watch this. When you look at when the angels came with the shepherds first and now the wise men. Remember, we said we parallel that with uh, Great Controversy 313, 314 as the setting of the scene for the first and second angel's message. In early writing, she makes this parallel. She says this, those who rejected John could not be benefited by Christ's message nor the message of the disciples. What are we seeing, brothers and sisters? The first, second, third angel with John, Christ, and the disciples. Watch this. Those who reject the first angel could not be benefited by the second, nor could enter into the experience of the third. Wait a minute. How are we going to come to the point where we are going to reject and not receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit because we will not recognize. Now, John, John, John came with a message of repentance. Wait a minute. This is opening my eyes. John came with a message of repentance. And those who did not receive the message of repentance could not receive the message of Christ. Watch this. When you look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 13, verse 14, down to verse 21, watch this. There's a message that is given to the last day church. And what is this message? It is a message of repentance. And by the message of repentance, the, by the message that exposes us to who we are, we are now prepared to enter, to receive Christ who brings the eye salve, the garment and the gold. He knocks. He brings these things in. But he cannot come in until we recognize our condition. We recognize our condition and we are led to repentance and repentance brings about confession. Confession opens the door for Christ to bring these gifts in. How can we come to the point of abandoning opposition and joining the ranks of the opposition is because we will not recognize our condition. And why will we not recognize our condition? Because we have silenced the preachers who would show us our condition. Who is silencing these preachers? Not just Annas and Caiaphas, brothers and sisters, but these profess present truth under the guise, and they are the Judases who are throwing the minds into confusion throwing the minds into confusion. So many are going to reject this message because of Judas and because of the scribes and the Pharisees, the pastors, the ministers of our day. Many are going to be led to reject it and abandon it because they won't receive the message. Watch, come back to our screen. Brothers, this is, I hope, Lord, I hope you got that. I hope you caught it. Notice. Watch this, the report of the angels visit to the shepherds had been brought to Jerusalem, but the rabbis had treated it, watch this, as unworthy of their notice. They themselves might have found Jesus and might have been what? Ready to lead the Magi to his birthplace. Philip, my mic is still on. Yeah. But, but instead of this, the wise men came to call their attention to the birth of the Messiah. Where is he that is born King of the Jews? They said, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. 
now pride and envy, what? Close the door against the light. Have mercy. Let's pause. Let's pause. Notice, brothers and sisters. The shepherds came there, there, there. Uh, uh, they treated the message worthy of our, worthy of our, it's not worthy of our notice. Who are these shepherds? Who are these ignorant shepherds? They have not gone to our schools. They have not, they have, they have, they have not been, they have not uh, uh, had um, uh, 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 the, the, they have not been, they have not been, um, we have not conferred on them the, the right to a public speaker. Who are they to tell us that we're living in the last days? When we, we need to know we're living in the last days, our scholars will tell us. That's what they said in the days of Noah. We, who, uh, uh, no, no, let them out. They are not allowed to pre talk to the people in the churches. It's amazing, brothers and sisters, that people who are volunteers, volunteers, we give voluntary, we, we volunteer our offerings to the church every week. We voluntarily write checks. We voluntarily put money in. We, vo we of a voluntary nature go and sit in churches. Volunteer. And yet, many people allow themselves to be dictated to as if they were owned. As if they were owned by these men. It's amazing that people allow themselves to be dictated to as if they were owned. We're volunteers. And you mean to tell me that you would dare come and tell a volunteer that he cannot, he cannot preach? Now, if he's preaching error, I understand that brothers and sisters. I understand if things are being done that is uncouth and ungodly totally understand. But you mean to tell me that you would tell a volunteer that you have no right to preach in this building? You have no right to ask volunteers to support that which God has ordained? You, you would command volunteers not to do this. And you know what, brothers and sisters? We're going to come to those preachers who are masquerading. You know, many of them allow themselves to be dictated to. And they will come and, hey, hey, yeah, I, I know it's not right. I know it's not right. But, but, but this is being dictated to. You people are literally dictating who, where, what you can do and where you can go. Hey, can you please, as a volunteer... Can you please come and preach? I can't. Why? Because the conference has not invited me. But I thought you were a volunteer. I, 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 I thought that you, I thought when you accepted the call to ministry, that you would go wherever the Lord calls. Yeah, I, I, I said that. But, but, I believe God is working through these men, telling you not to go and preach the truth? Yes. Okay. So do you believe you're called of God or you're called of the conference? What do you mean by that? Nothing. And this is what people are doing. You have people that will not go to certain places because... I understand the fear of the Pharisees that when the people are afraid and they don't know what to do, I tell people, listen, don't, 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 don't get yourself in trouble for me. I know where I stand. I'm not afraid of the, the, the labels. I'm not afraid of, you know, oh, he's an offshoot. I'm beyond that. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of how people view. I'm not concerned with that. But there are many people who have not come to that point, and thus I don't urge my volunteer service upon them because I understand that people have to come to these decisions on their own. 
but I don't urge my presence upon them. So I understand, I understand that, but in, but just initially I can't come because I have put myself in a mindset where I have to be dictated to. So now the Magi come and they call their attention to the birth of Christ. They, they, they want to, hey, we have seen a star. Notice, pride and envy close the door against the light. If the reports, watch this, if the reports brought by the shepherds and the wise men were credited, they would place what? The priests and the rabbis in a most unenviable position. Why? Disproving their claim to be the exponents, exponents of the truth of God. If we acknowledge these preachers who have not gone to our schools, then it places us in a bad light. And for this reason, we won't accept, we can't accept them. Brothers and sisters, people have often asked me, why will conferences, and I say you don't, you, 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 you really don't get it. Because these men and women have gone to schools, they have gotten degrees, they have gone in debt, they have had to make serious compromises, they have had to almost basically shut down reason in order to get where they are. And here you come along, freedom of conscience, uh, uh, religious, I mean, you come with none of this. And all of a sudden they look at you and they say, no, no, I, uh, uh, I'm not going to accept him as my equal. I had to go to school for six years and sit up on the professors that I, that I, at first I believed they were lying, but the more I listened to the lie, the more it became the truth in my mind. And I went through all the necessary hurdles to be accepted. I joined a fraternity. Um, I'm, 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 I'm a part, I'm a, I'm a frat brother. I've gone through all of the, I've, I've, you know, I've bowed and kissed the rings of all the people I had to do. And you come along and want to be on the equal level. No, I can't, I can't accept him. And, and they can't accept it. They, 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 they're not going to accept it. But unfortunately, many people are doing whatever they can to come in harmony with them. Ooh, brothers and sisters, this is setting us up for Judas. Notice, so they said, if we accept this message, if we give credit to these men and to what they're bringing to us, then that means we're telling the people that God can speak to somebody else other than me, mercy. These learned teachers would not stoop to be instructed by those whom they termed heathen. It could not be, they said, that God had passed them by mercy to communicate with ignorant shepherds or uncircumcised Gentiles. They determined to show their contempt for the reports that was exciting King Herod and all Jerusalem they would not even go to Jerusalem to see whether, those, whether these things were so. And they led the people to discard the interests in Jesus. Watch this. Come on now. Jesus, present truth. Put it there. In your, put it there. They, watch this. And they led the people to disregard the interests in present truth. Wait a minute. His name shall be called what? Jesus, for he shall save his people from their what? Sins. Jesus wasn't coming to make the church great again. Jesus was coming to call the church to repentance so that she could receive the blessings of God. But repentance must first come. And so Jesus held out to the church her true condition. Luke chapter four. This is what he did. He said, hey, 
I've come to set the captives free to, and he went through this whole uh, uh, series of things that needed to happen to the church. And he says, today, this scripture fulfilled in your ears, Luke 4, 28, that says, and the people were filled with wrath when they heard the message, when they heard that message. But where did it start? It started here. It started back here, brothers and sisters, with the first angel's message. It started here. Watch, watch, watch. It says they could, they would not even go to Jerusalem to see whether or not these things were so. And they led the people to regard the interest in Jesus as a fanatical excitement. Watch this. Here began the rejection of Christ by the priests and rabbis. From this point, their pride and stubbornness grew into a settled hatred of the Savior. Now, I don't have time to go into the false teachings. We will get to that next week. Um, as a matter of fact, you know what? Put a pin in it. We will come back. Hmm, I wonder. We'll see. I was thinking about tomorrow evening at five, but we'll see. We'll see how the Lord will lead. But notice this from this point, their pride, stubbornness grew into a settled hatred of the Savior. This began the rejection of Christ. So now, how do we get to the point of Annas and Caiaphas and the, 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 the Sanhedrin board taking him to Pilate to be killed? It started here. And it grew. How do we get to the point of abandoning the third angel? by rejecting the message of repentance, by rejecting the message of repentance. What is the message of repentance? It is a message that called and it exposes us for who we are. It exposes, but we don't want that message. And by not wanting it is growing into a settled hatred for truth, brothers and sisters. When you begin to understand what present truth is and all of the features of it, you will see that many people that have, that are labeled present truth preachers, you will realize that they are nothing more than ultra conservatives, ultra conservatives. And we are told brothers and sisters that it is the conservative class that is going to push for the national Sunday law. It is a conservative class that is going to lead the people of God to a Sunday law. Oh, you watch this brothers and sisters. What we're seeing, what we call present truth is nothing more than conservatism. It's not present truth because many don't understand the features of what present truth is.